Good morning, uh, friends um, from India around the globe. Um, and uh, Mr. Director, thank you for very kind words and a lovely event uh, as a Regina Dialogue is. And truly, I would like to thank Minister uh, Jai Shankar uh, and the URF for the opportunity to be here. I'm standing in front of you as a proud uh, foreign minister of a small country, Estonia, that started its membership in the UN Security Council this month. And I would like to thank all of you who place the trust and confidence in us all over the globe. Uh, and it, it, as it was not an uh, empty seat voting last May. It, it is for us a great privilege as well as an opportunity to, to exercise global responsibility. Although not comparable in size nor geostrategic outlook, Estonia and India share something very dear to both of us. The love of freedom and democracy. India is the most populous democracy in the world with 1.3 billion people and Estonia is of the smallest with a population of just 1.3 million. There's a thousand times difference. But the beauty of democracy is that no matter how small you are, your voice counts. And India and Estonia have mutually respected each other for almost 100 years. Dear friends, I'm very happy about the increasing mutual interest between India and Estonia, and a special thanks for that goes to Prime Minister Modi, under whose leadership special attention is being paid to small states. In August last year, we were happy to host a high-level visit to Estonia by Vice President Venkaya Naidu. Like Estonia, Estonia and India both, Estonia is a strong believer in the rules-based multilateral system and liberal international order. The role of small states in the international system is often underestimated. However, especially in the UN Security Council, small states who form the majority of the United Nations family are well placed to offer an important and credible voice with moral authority. They remind all member states of their obligations under international law, reaffirm normative commitments to compliance and advocate for a recommitment to a multilateral, rules-based international order. Diplomats of small states know that international law is their first line of defense. Most small states present themselves as champions of international law. They can also prove to be better listeners, especially when dealing with multiple perspectives on international law. As the former president of Estonia, Lennart Merion, said, the nuclear weapon of small states is international law. The restoration of Estonia statehood without any bloodshed in 1991 was facilitated by persuasive arguments taken from international law. The majority of the global community never recognized the Soviet annexation of Estonia and considered Estonia as a part of in the Soviet Union unlawful. This policy of non-recognition became an important ray of hope for many of us living under the totalitarian regime and paved the way for the restoration of our independence. The Singing Revolution is a commonly used name for events between 1987 and 1991 that led to the restoration of the independence of Estonia and other Baltic states. Estonia's experience shows that a bloodless fight for freedom is possible. This coincides with the spirit of Mahatma Gandhi's politics of non-violence. To honor this great hero of India and the entire world, Estonia has decided to raise a statue of Mahatma Gandhi in the Estonian capital, Tallinn. Much has changed since the restoration of our independence. We have become one of the most integrated nations in our part of the world. We have joined the United Nations, the European Union, NATO, WTO, and subsequently the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And we have benefited immensely from these multilateral development uh, formats. According to this so-called natural progression, Estonia was elected as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council to serve from this year to next. The multilateral system that was established after the Second World War is a network of agreements and organizations created to save future generations from grave sufferings and endless wars. It is widely believed that institutionalized international cooperation provides relative stability, security, and predictability. If this cooperation fails, the probability for conflict increases and we fail to collectively 
stop acts of aggression, terrorism, and other grave violations of international law. The United Nations is the so-called primary infrastructure for global cooperation. The Charter of the UN stands as a constitution for this cooperation. It serves as a source of peace and stability, only for as long as its principles are upheld. UN Secretary General Guterres has reminded that while the Charter's principles are as relevant as ever, we must continue to update its tools, and we must use those tools with greater determination. Those with special tools and privilege granted by the Charter have also special responsibility, especially when it comes to the veto. Estonia believes that countries should refrain from voting against initiatives preventing or halting mass atrocities. It remains crucial that the Security Council engages and reacts in situations of grave violations of international humanitarian law. That has not been the case when it comes to the tragedy in Syria. The veto has been used over and over again, and Syrian people pay the highest possible price. Starting use of humanitarian cases uh, as a certain hybrid tool uh, to solve the geostrategic, to defend geostrategic national interest is not an issue which needs to be um, morally justified. Looking to the recent uh, debates in the Security Council, um, referring to these. Article 2 of the Charter reminds us that all members sh shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. There are few values more important to a small country than this one. In this context, we are observing with concern how violations of international law, including the UN Charter, are taking place also in Europe. Regarding the violations uh, against Ukraine and Georgia, the breach of UN uh, Charter uh, by the uh, aggressive uh, acts uh, of military power used by Russian Federation, the Security Council has been among those who have drawn attention to grave breaches of international law against those countries. Estonia also believes that increased joint pressure to reform the Security Council is needed more than ever. And we emphasize with the common position of Africa on the composition of the Security Council. However, we also support increasing the number of permanent seats. A number of countries, G4, uh, definitely deserve it. Brazil, Germany, Japan, and as a crown jewel, India. In the context of the UN, we should not forget that UN peacekeeping missions and peacekeepers are often the most visible face of the United Nations in countries where the organization is most needed. Estonia supports the Secretary General's Action for Peacekeeping Initiative and the general push to reform how the United Nations manages peacekeeping missions and the full peace and security pillar. Let me also commend the extensive contributions of India to UN peacekeeping missions around the world. India has been one of the largest contributors to the UN peacekeeping missions since the 50s. As one of the top contributors of troops and police, India is an example to follow for the international community. On the matter of terrorism, I would like to quote the words of Prime Minister Modi at the United Nations uh, 74th session. Today, Terrorism is one of the biggest challenges, not for any single country, but for the entire world and humanity. And it is imperative that the world unites against terrorism and that the world stands as one against terrorism. End of quote. I'm proud to say that as a member state of NATO, the European Union and the global coalition against Daesh, Estonia contributes to the fight against international terrorism on a daily basis. In addition, as an elected member of the United Nations Security Council, Estonia understands that international cooperation is the key to solving global issues affecting all of humanity. Friends, the notion of security is expanding. There are new challenges that can severely undermine global peace and security and should therefore be debated in the Security Council. Climate change and cybersecurity are two examples of such urgent challenges. 20 years ago, Estonia made the decision to build up our public governance system with the help of digital technology. Today, the Estonian digital ecosystem contributes uh, 
up to the 7% of the country's GDP each year. Estonia is one of the global champions in bringing the digital governance to everyday life. Secure e-voting, e-healthcare and e-banking are only some of the services Estonians are able to enjoy uh, online. The full catalogue of public digital services in Estonia is uh, about 3,000 so different uh, independent services. And it is our aim to make the interaction between the citizen and government transparent, secure and quick. And this can be done by combining a smart and innovative legal space with a deep trust and cooperation between the private and public sector. For any small state, the rules-based world order does not only enable to predict the behavior of states, but it also creates a more stable and secure international environment. And the same should and could be said about cyberspace. Estonia has been part of the United Nations First Committee Cyber Discussions since uh, 2009 within the group of governmental experts and contributed to the emergence of the first cyber norms that have been approved by the United Nations General Assembly. Estonian experts have led the compilation of the tiny manual that elaborates how international law applies to cyberspace. And it is important that states are aware of and able to operationalize these already existing norms and confidence building measures and contribute to cyber stability. And last but not least, I would like to mention climate change as one amongst one, amongst one of the priorities uh, of Estonia and Security Council. The Arctic is rapidly melting, creating a new ocean with the new geopolitical dynamics following closely behind. Sea levels are rising and are set to continue to rise, increasing storm surge and water insecurity in low-lying countries and coastal areas. Climate change has already played a role in disrupting regional and global security in a number of ways, such as extreme drought, flooding and fires. Global warming causes changes in flora and fauna and endangers the lifestyles and environments of people. And these problems are borderless, which means that countries must agree to work together in order to both try and mitigate the current effects of climate change while staving off any potential catastrophe in the near future. Dear friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is so much more to be said, but even more to be done to tackle all those challenges. Great Indian writer Ramindarach Tagore, well known and loved also in Estonia, has said, you can't cross the sea merely by standing and staring at the water. Let us all join in action and use the tools we have to relieve the suffering and diminish injustice in this still small but lovely world. Thank you very much. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Minister. Thank you for the address. My name is Jan, I'm from the Czech Republic and uh, coming from a fellow small uh, post-communist uh, member EU state, I'd like to uh, hear your take on um, the buzzword now in Brussels, which is two-speed Europe or multi-speed Europe. What is Estonia's take on this? Thank you very much. I think uh, what matters is uh, how we can change uh, reality. And speak, uh, speaking about the uh, European Union and its future, I think it is uh, most important uh, to address uh, how the European Union could be able first uh, to rise its uh, uh, geopolitical role. And the new uh, European Union Commission has given uh, strong significance to that uh, mission. And the secondly, how to f uh, execute already agreed uh, uh, aims, and we have also a clear set of uh, new uh, uh, missions uh, uh, what the European Union is addressing, uh, well, starting from the uh, climate change and uh, Paris Accords. So I would, uh, if we are speaking about the, uh, whether it's two-speed Europe, uh, so I think uh, we have to remain on the basis of current uh, treaties of European Union and to look uh, how we could uh, implement uh, uh, these more efficiently so that European Union's importance as a um, global uh, capable partner uh, will not fail but rise. Thank you.
Ankar, do you want to come in? And I have a question for you too, Minister, but uh, let's uh, hear Ankar first. Thank you very much, Minister. I work for the World Trade Organization, and I'm very heartened by your statements of your strong support of multilateralism. You also mentioned the challenges of climate change. So I wanted to ask, um, how would Estonia um, participate in the multilateralism system, especially in a time the dominant powers are, seems to be um, playing the game um, at the moment? So I would like to hear your views on this. Thank you. Well, it is sometimes referred, and now it is like, uh, uh, whether it not so dramatically said that uh, either it's an end of multilateralism or some crisis. I would be not uh, so pessimistic. There are uh, a rise of uh, um, state interests uh, and uh, bilateral uh, uh, power games we, we see, but uh, is it something new? No. Uh, we're, if we're looking back to the Cold War time, Okay, it was a relatively uh, uh, two polarized, uh, two uh, polarizations established world, as we remember. Uh, such kind of multilateralism I, I would not accept. Uh, many territories in the globe were occupied and annexed. Uh, the issue we see also today in some cases. Uh, so, um, what, what, is, what matters, what matters is there are core principles uh, fixed in the United Nations Charter. And if we, as a united mankind, would like and have ought, as a humans, uh, to avoid conflicts and human sufferings, then we have to give a clear united message that uh, to stop conflicts, the aggressors should have a clear uh, paycheck. They should not... Uh, uh, walk away with too low price uh, and could have a acceptance, whether factual or juridical acceptance, of the outcome of their aggression. So I think non-recognition policy of uh, uh, the uh, use of power uh, breaching the UN Charter should be the core of United Nations Security Council action. This is a very idealistic concept I'm uh, stating, uh, and we are far too away of that uh, idea. But if we want to avoid conflicts, uh, uh, also a uh, rising threat of modern technologies, cyber domain, asymmetrical threats uh, used by uh, different uh, countries or non-state players, uh, we have to also look how to restructure the working methods and principles of United Nations Security Council. Thank you. Mr. Minister, let me pose a question to you based on your remarks this morning. You, you, you clearly identified uh, Russian action which uh, has created a degree of anxiety in Estonia and other countries. Uh, my question to you is, does the entire European Union share these anxieties? Or do you think there are different approaches to Russia within the collective? I think uh, now Europe, and uh, in a broader sense also the transatlantic family, has uh, uh, been able uh, to keep unity. So basically, if we are looking also the sanctions policy, uh, European Union is addressing uh, the breaches of uh, uh, international law norms against uh, it, its uh, neighbors by Russia. Uh, so. Uh, European, this is passed in European Union by the principle of consensus, very painful principle, uh, consensus. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, we have managed to do it for years, now for five years. And uh, this is something, uh, I think, uh, where we look at whether sanctions have been in harmed uh, economically also uh, European, some business uh, entities, surely. But this is a price tag uh, where you look, say that values matter, the principles matter, the defense of the uh, freedom of uh, other countries, people, to choose the path in the world matters. And the business interests are uh, secondary ones in that matter. And I think uh, the, the world should be a value-based one. Thank so you. let me ask you the second part of this question. If values matter and business should take second seat, why is Europe Union divided on China? 
China is very big. <laughs> That's a good answer. Uh, no, no. I think, uh, but I think, uh, I think uh, China is, uh, is on rise uh, as a global uh, player. And surely, um, I think uh, the core principles uh, we believe uh, in addressing the world uh, problems should be uh, universal. If there are uh, vast breaches of uh, human rights, uh, the uh, acceptance of the uh, norms of uh, United Nations Charter, these should be uh, universal. And what's the difference? I think uh, international relations are tended and will be arbitrary ones uh, mm -hmm. between the uh, players. But I think the, uh, the core international law norms mm -hmm. Uh, are, should be established on an objective basis. They, are, they should not be uh, disputable uh, on an arbitrary basis. That's the difference. And so we, we see also, uh, 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 following the rise of China, it is uh, mm, how to, to address it. It is now debated uh, in uh, European Union. Uh, the next president of European Union Council is, uh, uh, is Germany. Germany is planning uh, to make also a, a summit uh, on between on, on China, where yes. all the heads of the states of European Union countries will take place. China has been also mentioned in the uh, last communique of NATO leader summit in London. So this is an issue we are following with uh, uh, with uh, uh, most interested way and manner in uh, European and transatlantic family. Thank you very much, Minister, for your intervention and for being with us this morning. Uh, to all of you, please join me in applauding the Minister for taking these questions.